Job. And so we know so far that horrible things happen to Job. Job is one of God's righteous persons. And because of uh, a bit of a, a talk in heaven with Satan, Satan says uh, that Job only does uh, what he does for God and only worships God because of all that he has. And God says, no, that Job is righteous. And because of that, no matter what, he will continue to worship God. And all these terrible things happen, and it brings us to the question of why. But what are we going to do with the question of why? Change it to how. Change it to how. Yes, I love when people listen. So we're, we're changing the question why we're setting why aside, and we're going to change it to how. How do we live in these difficult moments? How do we live when pain is there and suffering is there? And today we're going to talk about how do we minister to others? How do we come alongside others who are suffering in a way that is going to honor the same person as God sees them, as righteous and wonderful? We know in the book of Job, we've talked about the fact that Job's friends, they want to answer the question, why? And so they keep asking, you know, you must have sinned because these bad things would not have happened to you if you didn't sin. And then they say, well, you know, if it wasn't you that sinned, then it must have been your children that sinned because bad things wouldn't happen unless it was you or your children that would sin. And, you know, it must have been that you didn't mean to sin, but you still sin. And they're just keep, they keep pushing this agenda. And all the time, Job is saying, no, 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 no. So what do we do? How do we come alongside people who are suffering and honor the place in which they are? Will you uh, please pray with me? Dear God, I just ask you to be with each of us today, and I ask you to just open our hearts and open our minds in a way that we can be the people you've called us to be, to come alongside and to be caregivers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, Job's friends, they've heard of the disaster that has happened. They know the situation. They know he's wiped out completely. Financially, he's ruined. His family is destroyed and all dead. And life is just in a bad place for him. And they just can't stand the thought of their friend going through so much pain. They can't handle this raw anguish that he has, this deep depression. But you know what they do is they they do the right thing, and they come and they see Job. They come alongside him, and they sit. They sit quietly for seven days. When they first walk up, they see Job from a distance, and they can't even recognize him anymore because he's so changed that everything that has happened to him has just completely changed who he is and what he looks like. And they're broken by that. They don't know what to do. But they come and they sit. As we know that Job is sitting on the ground, that he's taken a, a pile of ashes and he's ripped his clothes He's sitting in these ashes, and his body is covered with sores, and he's left to the point that he is just sitting there scratching his sores with a piece of pottery. In the midst of that, they sit in quietness just to support their friend. Day one, day two, Day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. I don't know if uh, any of you have been with any Jewish friends. 
and they have a practice that's called to sit Shiva. And it very much comes from this tradition from the book of Job, that what you do is you come alongside someone who is in deep pain and grief because of the death of a loved one. And they come and they sit. And that's all you do, is just sit. You don't try to analyze what happened. You don't try to give answers. But instead, you sit in the quietness. And you allow the darkness of the moment to just hold there. And to remember that there are times in life when pain is so great that the only thing we can do is to sit and cry. I remember when I was young, uh, probably junior high, I had a friend who, um, whose father passed away. And um, it was his, the family was a Jewish family. Um, my mother worked for the woman, her name was Phyllis Shapiro. I remember that very well. And we came, we went to the house to sit Shiva with them. And everything was dark and they had covered all the mirrors and the family sat there just in absolute quietness. In contrast, I remembered other family members and through the years I had thought about various funerals that I had gone to. And you sit there in that line and people come up to you and they say words of gratitude and they share maybe some thoughts and some wisdom that's on their mind, but it, it's so, um, so much is happening. It's the same moment, it almost seems so much, uh, too much. I compare the, the moments of quietness and the sacredness of death. When we went and we sat with Phyllis and her family to the absurdity of a funeral that my family went to not too long ago. My cousin's husband passed away and he passed away way younger than uh, you would want anyone, uh, a father of a daughter that was still in high school. And the confusion in the midst of her trying to receive people and um, being moved around awkwardly by a funeral director and lines and lines of people and, and, and tears and brokenness. And at the end, I wondered if she was just more exhausted than feeling uplifted by the people who came to see her. Sometimes the best things that we can do is to come and then to sit in quietness. Rabbi Kushner says that Job did two things, Job's friends did two things right. The first thing that they did right was that they came. Because you know what? So often, it, when others are suffering, when they're in times of pain and grief, it's too much for us, and so we mail a card, or we send them a text. Or nowadays, we even send them condolences on Facebook. And what they really need is for us to just come to be with them, to stand beside them in this time of grief. So they did the right thing by coming. And the second thing that they did that was absolutely spot on was the fact that they didn't say anything. They didn't try to analyze the situation. They didn't try to say, you know, well, this is the best or God wanted your children back, or any of those kinds of things. God can do all things through those who um, uh, give, that God has the strength for all of those who believe in him. None of those things. Instead, they just sat in quietness and was present with him. 
After seven days, Job's three friends made a critical error. They opened up their mouths. And from that moment on, things just went downhill. You know, I'm sure that they had good intentions. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I understood what my mom would always say when she would say, the road, with, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because good intentions don't necessarily turn out good. And what they did was they just made Job sadder and more frustrated by his tragic situation. This was tough stuff. What happened was unthinkable. And so no words could ever offer him condolence. And they just wanted Job to be happy again. I mean, I think we're the same, right? When we see our friends in pain and suffering, we just want them to be happy. We just want life to go back together the way it was. But we can't do that. And maybe we shouldn't even be trying to do that because we're not giving God the time and the place and the opening to provide healing. You know, they wanted as much for Job as for themselves to make sense of what happened. Because if this happened to Job, who is a righteous man, then that means that the carpet could be torn right out from underneath them in a second. And they could have found themselves in the same situation. And they wanted to find a way to ward off the bad things. And if they could answer the question why, then they could make sure it wouldn't happen to them again. Job said to them at one point, you have proved to be no help. You see something dreadful and you are afraid. You see, they, he knew that they were thinking that he brought all this trouble upon himself. And they wanted this nice, neat, tidy explanation of a messy situation. And life is messy. You know, bad things happen. Cancer happens. Heart disease happens. Addictions happen. Children get sick. Bad things happen. Divorce broken relationships with parents and children. And nothing can kind of tie it up into a neat little package that we can go and just drop off and take care of. When the pain seems so senseless and scary, they tried to answer the question why so that they wouldn't be so frightened themselves. The sad reality is that we too often treat people the way Job's friends treated him. That we see a loved one and we see their pain and we don't know what to do. Job moved through his pain and he moved from this place of just quietness and brokenness and tears to a point in which he began to just pour out his anguish. He began crying out to God and they just couldn't stand to hear the words in which he was talking. <coughs> they couldn't stand hearing him now verbalize this deep pain that he was in. And often people who are in deep pain don't share because they're afraid, not of their reaction, but of our reaction to their pain. Only God can comfort the pain of those who are suffering. And so I invite you, when these moments come into your life, and I promise you they will come into your life, that there will be bad things that happen to all of us, 
to the friends that we have, to the ones that we love, to our neighbors, to our co-workers. And I ask you that when these things happen, that you go and you sit beside your friend, and that you, you hold their hand, and you are fully present with them. Don't worry about how the food is going to be cooked. Don't worry if the house is messy or not. Don't worry about all the arrangements that have to be made. But be present with them in their moment of suffering. I can tell you that your silent presence will make the most profound impact on them. Something far greater than any of your words could ever do. Because in suffering and pain, there are no words that ever can make it better. <clears throat> we, the body of Christ, are called to be God's agents. We are called to come in beside God's loved, beloved children and to have a ministry of presence. Bless you. And I wanted to find, uh, read a definition for you of a ministry of presence. This is the sacrificial giving of yourself to another, to be fully present with someone. This ministry of presence means that we will serve people even when it might make us uncomfortable, that we will stand with people in the midst of anxiety and fear. And this is a ministry that we should <coughs> practice with all of God's children, that we should be able to stand beside someone and not be distracted by all of life that is going around. Unfortunately, we in the Christian community, we don't sit Shiva. And so what happens is that the person dies and the, the undertaker comes and, and then right after this, you need the same day to go visit uh, the, uh, the funeral home and, and then you write an obituary the, the next day and it's in the newspapers and with, uh, within a few days all of this happens and there's all of this busyness and it's getting the church together and it's getting food and it's getting people transported back and forth and then it's over. And you're supposed to be able to put your smile back on and wipe away your tears and be all better. And maybe this is the place, this is the moment in which we can come beside people in the ministry of presence. You know, life becomes so busy that we forget to come alongside those people who are in pain. That we forget the widow and the widower. We forget the a single mom or a single dad, or the divorcee. We forget the people who are going through pain with this child that is suffering with an illness. We forget that people have real struggles and that we are called to be present with them, to not try to make it go away, not to counsel them. There are professionals that will do that. But to just guide them in the fact that they are loved by you. And because of your love, even without words, they will see God's love. You know, if Job's friends maybe had been a little bit more practiced in the ministry of presence all the time, then maybe they wouldn't have been so seeking an answer in this moment. Because the biggest thing that we can ever give anyone 
is our full attention and our time. I know in this season that I am in right now, it is so difficult and I feel like I don't have time to do any of the things that are important because I'm having to do so many things that are urgent. How about any of you feel the same way? That your life is just filled with a whole bunch of urgent things, deadlines, appointments, responsibilities, but that you're really missing to do what is important. That maybe the people that you truly love don't know how much they're loved. Well, I want to just close with a few words from Henry Gowan. More and more, the desire grows in me simply to walk around, to greet people, to enter into their homes and sit on their doorsteps, to play ball, to throw water, and to be known as someone who wants to live with them. It is a privilege to have the time to practice this simple ministry of presence. Still, it is not as simple as it seems. For my own desire to be useful, to do something significant, or to be a part of some impressive project is so strong that soon my time is taken up by meetings and conferences and study groups and workshops that prevent me from walking the streets. It's difficult not to have plans, not to organize people around an urgent cause, and not to feel that you are working directly for a social progress. But I wonder more and more if the first thing shouldn't be to know people by name, to eat and drink with them, to listen to their stories, to tell your own, and to let them know with words and handshakes and hugs, and I'm going to add there with telephone calls, mm -hmm. that you do not simply like them, but you truly love them.